So in this video, we're going to be designing a performant and scalable system for Apple's App Store. The system is going to consist of three main pieces. We're going to want a way that the user can search for apps that they're looking for. We want to be able to see top apps that have been searched for or downloaded on the platform. And we want a way to actually download those app binaries onto someone's phone. With the large quantity of apps available on the App Store and the extreme number of users that are browsing and downloading from it, building a system like this that can scale poses significant challenges. If you're an iPhone user, I'm sure you've noticed that during periods of high load, App Store search can actually be incredibly slow. So it's going to be really important to make sure that we compensate for those spikes in load and ensure that we don't degrade performance for our users. So before we dive into the actual design of this system, let's first take a look at some requirements. In terms of functional requirements, as we mentioned earlier, we want users to be able to search for an app by using a keyword. So if they search for any word that's present in the name or description of that application, they should be able to see that app on a list. We also want users to be able to see a list of top downloaded apps, and we also want users to be able to see top searches that are being made by other users. We of course want our app binaries to be actually downloadable, and we also want our app listing to have descriptions and screenshots that our users can reference. For non-functional requirements, we really want to make sure that our app search is very fast, even under periods of extreme load. We also want to make sure that our app downloads are very fast, and we want them to be fast regardless of the geographic location of our user. So regardless of where in the world our user is located, they should be able to have low latency when downloading applications. For scale in this system, we're talking about about 2 million apps available on the store and about 100 million daily active users. So let's take a look at the core piece of the system, which is just the app database. So we of course want to have some sort of system that can store all of the metadata about all of the apps on our system, and we could really use any database we want for this. The database is going to store information such as the name of the app, its description, the number of downloads that the app has had, as well as the screenshots and binaries for that app. Because of the amount of load that we're going to be placing on this database, we're probably going to want to replicate this database to ensure that we can handle all of the read requests coming into it. So this means that we'd essentially have multiple instances of our database, and all of the load from our users would be distributed across all of them. Another challenge that we run into here is actually storing these screenshots in binaries. We of course can't store this type of data directly inside the database, first of all because there's simply too much data, and secondly because this would significantly degrade query performance on our database. Databases aren't really designed for storing this type of unstructured large binary data, so we're going to want to introduce a blob store that's specifically designed for storing large binary content, and our database will, instead of storing the data directly, store links to URLs stored on our blob store. These links could be in the form of URLs or keys to identify the data in the blob store. Blob stores are very good at holding extremely large amounts of data because they are able to distribute that data across a number of nodes. So if we have too much data to store on a single node, we'll be able to add more nodes to our cluster and increase the available storage size for that blob store. Now, in order to give our users access to the system, we need some sort of API that will sit in front of everything. This API will be some sort of HTTP server most likely, and would have an endpoint something like get app slash ID, and that would return all of the metadata associated with a particular app. The API would be responsible for going out to the database and getting the data from the database and then returning it to our user. This API sort of represents the entry point into the system for our user. We're not going to worry too much about security and paid apps in this video, so we're going to be okay with having our blob store be public to the internet, and our API can simply return a public URL that references this blob store so our users can download content such as screenshots and the app binaries directly from that blob store. So if we recall our non-functional requirements, we specified that we wanted our users located anywhere in the world to be able to download apps with low latency. However, our blob storage system is likely going to be stored in one data center somewhere around the globe, and any users that want to download data from it would then have to traverse all the way across the internet, all the way to that disk-based blob store, and then download a large file from it. This could introduce a lot of latency, especially under periods of high load. So in order to optimize this system, we're going to introduce a content delivery network, or CDN, in front of our blob store. This CDN is going to be responsible for caching the data in our blob store, and it's going to be distributed across the globe. So we're going to have multiple points of presence across the globe where the CDN can be deployed, and that'll allow our users to access the data in a geographic location that's very close to them. This will significantly reduce latency, significantly reduce load on our blob store, and significantly increase load on internet infrastructure, especially in underdeveloped areas. Areas. So at this point, we have a working system for storing our metadata and binaries for our apps on our app store, and we have a good way for our users to access them quickly. The next problem we're going to tackle is searching through all of this data. So in order to enable search for our app store, we're going to want to introduce some sort of database that can store all of the text associated with our particular apps and can index them in such a way that we can search by keyword. Some databases actually have this functionality built in, but if we're using a database that doesn't, we could also rely on an external service such as Elasticsearch to provide this service. 
those. So essentially what this would mean is any data that we'd write to our database would also be written to Elasticsearch and indexed within Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch would use a technology called inverted indexes, which would enable us to search on that data. When our user makes a request to search in our app store, they'd send that request to our API, and our API would go out to Elasticsearch to find the app that the user is looking for. This would be using a simple keyword-based search, and then our API could query the database for additional context, and this would allow it to produce an even more relevant list of results to the user. The sort of post-processing that would go on on the API could use any number of algorithms to determine which results are most relevant to the user, and the job of Elasticsearch is really just to narrow the number of results from 100 million down to a few results that can be processed by the API. Elasticsearch is going to be really good at that because it's able to be sharded and replicated so that the load on the system can be distributed across multiple machines. This means that even if we have a high volume of searches coming in, we should be able to scale our Elasticsearch cluster to be able to handle that load. A further optimization that we can make to this searching system would be introducing an in-memory cache such as Redis. Essentially how this would work is instead of making a request all the way to Elasticsearch, our API could first make a request to Redis, which would hopefully have the data cached in memory. Elasticsearch is primarily a disk-based system, so by caching our search results on an in-memory system, we'll be able to significantly reduce the latency and reduce load on our Elasticsearch cluster. If the data we're looking for isn't stored in Redis, our API can still fall back to our Elasticsearch cluster, which is sort of the source of truth for search data. A Redis instance would use least frequently used eviction. This means that if the Redis instance runs out of storage space, we'd keep the most frequently used items, so the searches that our users are making very frequently would be more likely to be cached in memory. The final problem that we need to tackle for this system is storing those download metrics and top searches so that our users can query them. This type of data could be problematic to store in a database, because if every single user that makes a search or downloads an app has to actually write out to our metadata database to log that, this could introduce a lot of load for our database. Furthermore, we could have problems with concurrency, meaning that if two users download an app at the same time, we'd need to introduce additional complexity to make sure that both of those users' updates to the database don't conflict with each other. A more scalable approach to storing this type of data would be to use a separate time series database, which would store an entry for every single download that a user makes and every single search that a user makes. This would result in a huge quantity of data, so it's going to be really important to shard this time series database so that we can have multiple nodes storing the data. Time series databases, however, are very good at aggregating this type of data, meaning that they can very efficiently calculate, for example, the sum of all of the downloads for a particular app. Optimizing data storage like this in a time series database is a very complex topic, and we won't get into it right now, but using this type of a data model will give us a lot of flexibility in how we query all of this historical data, and we'll offload all of the load of storing and updating this data off of our main database. Once we have this time series database in place, our users can make requests to their API to get, for example, the list of top apps, and our API would be responsible for gathering this data from the time series database. So that concludes our high-level overview of this type of system. Of course, there's a lot of places that we can dive a lot deeper into the specifics of how a system like this would work. For example, thinking about how our database would be sharded and replicated, and how our data model would be structured within our metadata database and our time series database. There's also a lot of other aspects to a system like this, for example, the process of uploading an application and getting it reviewed. This would certainly add a lot of additional complexity that we didn't discuss in this video. If you're curious to learn more about this topic, I would encourage you to research more about all of these topics that we discussed in this video and think about how this sort of system would work at a lower level. If you enjoyed this video, you can find more content like this on interviewpen.com. We have tons of more in-depth system design and data structures and algorithms content for any skill level, along with a full coding environment and an AI teaching assistant. You can also join our Discord, where we're always available to answer any questions you might have. If you or a friend wants to master the fundamentals of software engineering, check us out at interviewpen.com.